uh, in finance you always look at return on investment yes. right uh, and uh, for me it is return on ro i call it as roce not roi return on compassion and empathy is phenomenal mm -hmm. for a leader so so i think you really need to look at uh, how do you measure this and for me i think it's about the uh, happiness that brings uh, uh, that you show to the i mean it brings about in the people and also how loyal they become when you show compassion and empathy Hi Vishy. Hey, hi. Pleasure yeah, to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, and uh, thanks for joining our uh, session today. It's a great pleasure to have you on this uh, session, which is beyond the balance sheet. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate. Vishy, you are an industry veteran. You are a business leader. You are a CEO of Randstad, and you are also a transformation turnaround expert. And more than everything else, at the core, you are a finance professional. Right? You are a chartered accountant, and that to a rank holder. and you have had wide industry experience over three decades cutting across multiple industries diverse industries right and also across uh, indian conglomerates as well as us based mnc's whether it is tvs group to start with ge motorola and now randstad and you've been here for a long time and you are a cfo here now moved on to a successful ceo role enormous experience and expertise our audience will be delighted to hear more from you and if you can share your experience and insights of this journey from CFO to CEO to begin with would like to ask you a very pertinent and popular question right it's all about perception in corporate world you know perception is reality right are considered to be a real reality right and most often finance professionals are seen as number oriented mm -hmm. not people oriented mm -hmm. when they're not connected to people they're connected to numbers mm -hmm. what is your experience as a cfo and now as a ceo mm -hmm. and did you make any specific attempt to change this perception about yourself as well as uh, the people around you to hope, perceive about the perception about finance and why did you do that well okay i think uh, that's a great question i mean the perhaps a very pertinent question for any finance person to think about uh, firstly i must uh, admit that finance is a very noble profession i think uh, uh, there have been it has evolved over time at some point in time they were watch dogs uh, uh, and and even before that they were blood hounds going after the <laughs> sales team correct you know <laughs> targets yeah. uh, you know actuals forecast correct and then there was a period when they transformed into watchdogs and then now i think it's more about co-driving the business uh, creating the strategy uh, so so i think finance as a function as evolved Evolve. it's a very integral part of any organization because uh, the question is do they report to investors do they report to the senior management team uh, or or they also have the internal stakeholders within the company end of the day they drive accountability so so from that perspective i have a great regard for that function i think uh, early in my career i realized that um, you know finance needs to be a little bit more and and the reason why i say that is i went around listening to the voice of different functions i used to go and meet sales people and okay. tell me about your finance function uh likewise to operations or procurement or hr or it you know different teams within the organization and some common themes came uh, great people very intellectually strong uh, very task oriented task oriented yeah. and uh, they deliver outcomes and uh, the outcomes could be in terms of reporting mm. uh, getting the books audited compliance uh, making policies etc and i said tell me more mm. they also came up with few other things oh they are very dull they are very boring uh, the other side of finance yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are very bureaucratic understood uh, mm. so so to me i think it was like a mix of great things and things which are more behavioral which could have been improved or which could be bettered uh, so i realized that okay as a 
as belonging to the finance fraternity, I need to do something to change the perception. And how much can I do to influence as many finance people or teams to change their mindset? Here yeah. in Grandstand, or you did this no, across I've been doing it uh, well. in the past uh, two decades. I've been doing it uh, okay. right from the time I was a CFO in 2004. That was the first time okay. I, I became a CFO. Uh, and I realized that, uh, you know, I also have worked in great brands, but then I worked in businesses which were extremely challenging. They were in distress, either because the, they were losing money, they were not able to collect cash, or, um, you know, there were dissatisfied customers. So most of them were in the red. Red. And That's why you probably are called a turnaround expert. <laughs> right. So I realized that, you know, there was a pattern when I looked closely. Um, it was not that their products were bad. It was not that their services were bad. But it was the morale of the people in the organization, which was not to the level that it should be. Uh, mm -hmm. So this was causing a lot of... Uh, challenges, no collaboration, no teamwork, uh, and that was showing up in the results. Uh, so I realized that, you know, by changing people's mindsets, you could change business fortunes, business results. So I started working on how, as a finance leader, I can create a culture of uh, high performance and how much can I influence the teams across, whether it is HR or the senior management, to adopt policies where people feel motivated? You cannot set unrealistic challenges and make people fail. You rather create a create a platform where people can overachieve, and not by committing mediocre targets, realistic targets, but reward outperformance. So it could be through incentive policies. It could be through facilitating programs, you know, and what can finance do to simplify? How can we drive more external focus than people spending a lot of time on expense claims uh, and, and those kind of things? And I have done three transformations in my career so far. Everywhere, either the business has outperformed, gone out of the red, or has reached a stage of break-even. Uh, and just because the people in the organization behave differently. So so that's my forte. Uh, and, and I believe that that's a perfect recipe for anybody in finance uh, to, to be more business partnering and be more strategic uh, and try and see how you can simplify things for your stakeholders within the company. In your career journey from CFO to CEO, you would have come across multiple challenges the challenges that you face and the lens you wear as a CFO versus the lens now you wear as a CEO, they may be different. What are the qualities and attributes that are keeping you successful in today's environment as a CEO? That you owe it back to your finance function or a CFO hat mm -hmm. that you were wearing. I think, I think the most uh, critical part of, uh, you know, my learning is customer centricity, you know. Uh, I think you need to know who your customer is and how your work is impacting that customer. It could be an internal customer, it could be an external. So in finance, most often it is a lot of internal stakeholders. So, so I think it's about understanding how your work is impacting them whether it's in a positive way or is it creating a roadblock, right? And as long as you have that customer focus, I think uh, most often you're going to do the right things. Second thing is about... Sorry to interrupt you here. Sure. As a CFO, were you very focused towards your customer? And as a CEO now, you are saying, no, you are more customer focused than as a CFO you were? No, I mean, I think uh, in any role, I think any role you got to have your customer focus. Uh, so as a CFO is when I began it, and now I think I got to do it a lot more. Do you meet with your customers? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, it's a coincidence that uh, this year I began by reflecting on what is the need of the business. And I realized that uh, uh, we got to be a lot more external focused. Uh, we were doing a lot of things, a lot of meetings and uh, work internal out focus. and things like that. So a lot of time was being spent on internal processes. If we are able to shift that externally, meet more clients, I think we could get a lot more 
from the same uh, effort. So, and I needed to lead by example. So I set a goal for myself that I'm going to meet 50 of my top clients this year. Uh, and uh, coincidentally, I think we are in the beginning of May and I've already met 55 of them. Congratulations. So, right. So, mm-hmm. so I think uh, it begins with that. And it's also a movement, right? As a leader, whether you're right. a CFO or a CEO, you got to garner the organization's support and energies. You have to channelize them in the way you think is the most productive. Productive, yes. And if you are leading by example, people follow you, right? So I see now my sales teams doing more meetings. Mm-hmm. I see my client partnering team doing more meetings. So, so the number of external meetings is You've gone up significantly, gone up significantly. Which in turn is resulting in better business results. Absolutely. Absolutely. Vishy, it is indeed very, very interesting to see a CFO meeting up with customers, uh, also as a CEO, you are meeting up with customers, right? I have not seen in my career and experience that many CFOs go and meet up with customers and they do carry a target for themselves that I need to go and meet up with 30, 40, 50 odd customers, right? So once you start leading the example, the rest of the organization, you know, actually you know, flock around and get each other as right. it does improve your productivity, it does uh, bind the people together. Uh, any other skills that you have developed as a CFO now is actually serving you well as a CEO, which is kind of, you know, giving you time and ability to deal with various stakeholders and uh, multitask many things. Because as a CEO, you have to have a lot of external focus right. and at the same time deal with the board, investors, and all bunch of others, right? So right. what are those skills that you have gained uh, as a leader of finance and now uh, able to utilize this effectively as a CEO? Right. I, I think there are many. I will talk about a couple of them. One is about uh, curiosity, intellectual curiosity. I think uh, we are, as finance people, great analytical skills. We know how to report numbers. Uh, Now, how does a non-finance person articulate these? Now, how do they assimilate and translate that into actual actions that lead to business, uh, you know, outcomes? Uh, So, for example, I think if it is a... Uh, collection meeting. I think most often we know how to steer it based on receivables, what's your overdues, what's your DSO. DSO. I think we are, as finance people, we are naturally good at that. Good at that, yes. But I think uh, what I think about is, uh, you know, why is a client not paying? Not paying, invoice? road cars. Right. Uh, it's about getting a little bit deeper into, is my invoices going on time? What's the time taken from uh, the invoice to actually it reaching the customer's uh, gate? And, uh, uh, and of course, today with automation, a lot of them are e-invoices. But, uh, but typically, it could be multiple reasons. It could be because, uh, one, we delayed the invoicing in itself. Or it could be a courier delay. Or it never received. it was never received by the recipient. Or by the person concerned. Or by the person concerned. concerned. And there could be a bureaucracy within the client organization where it has to go to different yeah. desks for approval. Uh, so for me, I think it's a simple thing is, uh, I look at it like an ATM machine. I go and drop 100 rupees of cash in my bank account. I go to the next machine, print my passbook. It's already reflecting. Reflecting. There. So I always think about if I'm raising an invoice in my books, how much time does it take to reflect as a payable in my client's book? Client. Oh. And if that distance you are able to reduce, there is no way there is going to be delay. There will be very few clients who delay it because of cash flow or other reasons. It's mostly the process that takes time. So if you are able to address that process, I think there is no reason why you will have overdues. So start thinking a little bit deeper into what's the root cause, what is it that I can control, what is it that I don't control. The second thing I would say is, uh, as a finance leader, uh, we really need to be uh, use that tool of reflection. Reflection, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a very powerful tool. I do reflections every day. For yourself or in a larger meeting? It's about how I play on my mind. What did I do from 9 to 6 in the evening? Which meetings did I attend? And now, did I do well? What could I have done better? So I think about self-improvement. And sometimes it could be that I did something wrong. What should I do to correct that action? So if I was wrong with somebody, I behaved in a way which was rude or something, I 
make it point to call them in the end of the day and say, hey, this meeting went this way. I know I told you this, and this is what led me to do that. Uh, nice. So, so that allows you to also follow a constant process of improvement, improvement and course correction, right. and 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 that helps leaders to also get better organized, right? So, so these are a couple of things. Of course, there are quite a few, um, you know, which which also are important. You know, uh, it's also about. Uh, adhering to time timelines you know most often uh, and this could be my perception but most often i think we don't plan well you know uh, we plan our own deliverables within the finance, finance department but we don't set up those meetings in anticipation of okay after this closing i have a review that needs to happen so let me respect other people's calendars fix those toll gates so that i can you know go and make that reviews as soon as my closure is done. But we realize it only after the closure that hey, I need to set up that meeting. Leadership as a CEO is not about just you no know, a business facing. You have multiple you know, priorities, etc. Right. So uh, you are also dealing with people, which is a very, very sensitive area. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard about you, uh, you, your belief that uh, compassion and empathy are extremely critical. Mm -hmm to success as a leader. Right. Would love to understand a little more about your view as a, and how are you, what, what is your authentic self and how are you as a compassionate leader able to really drive high performance mm -hmm. by bringing in a culture of empathy among sure. your teammates. I think uh, we often think that uh, some of these empathy and compassion are born traits. You know, people get it through their genes. <laughs> uh, DNA but, and genes. Yeah. Mm. But I think, uh, to me, I think it's all about growth mindset. Uh, if you want to grow these traits, you need to really focus and cultivate it. In a systematic way. In a systematic way. Uh, now, COVID taught us a lot of lessons. Mm. And I think... Uh, and it's also to do with the era, right? There was a period where it was very authoritarian leadership. You, your boss gives you instructions, you just execute, execute it, right? And if you don't get execute, you, you don't execute well, then you're going to be shouted upon or uh, condemned, right? Um, I think that's one style. It may perhaps work for some period of time, but that's right. not a sustainable thing. People would just lead right. organizations and go. Uh, so I think you need to have a leadership style which is a little bit more situational. You need to be sometimes authoritative. You need to be sometimes following a coaching style. Understood. Sometimes more democratic where you need people to accept what you are saying. So I think it has to be a style which is to the situation. Uh, COVID uh, brought in a lot of changes to leadership styles. And that's when people started talking a lot more about empathy and compa uh, compassion, right? So what is empathy? Empathy is about, okay, somebody says, I have a personal situation. Uh, there is a grief in the family. Somebody and got, well, uh, they you know, got an accident. Um, you know, they hurt their leg. They are not able to come to work. I think you make a call, empathize about, oh, no, uh, I'm sad that it happened. Uh, how are you coping with it? I hope you have the right kind of uh, attention. Uh, take a break, come back to work uh, when you feel that you are okay. And now, that's not good enough. That's that's okay, but it that's may a not, good start. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it's a genuine emotion. To me, compassion is a little bit more, right? If you know that because of that injury, this person is not going to be there for two weeks, uh, somebody has to manage his work. Uh, if he is going to Taking come back after 15 days and see that his workload has piled up Double and he's day. going to, next few days he's going to work overtime, uh, it's going to be a slog, I think you're not being compassionate. Compassion. Compassionate is also about making that additional effort to say, by the way, I think I know that you're not going to be in for two weeks. I'm going to assign your work to somebody in your team and they would step up and we want to make sure that you know you are not disturbed we want you back to work uh, as and when you feel good about it, right? So that's taking that extra step to ensure that 
you are showing real compassion to to and and then uh, making them feel reassured that uh, you know whatever happened to you i think you don't need to be regretful about it uh, so i always look at myself as you know as for me the definition of uh, um, you know uh, in finance you always look at return on investment yes. right uh, and uh, for me it is return on ro i call it as roce not roi return on compassion and empathy is phenomenal for a leader so so i think you really need to look at uh, how do you measure this and for me i think it's about the uh, happiness that brings uh, uh, that you show to the i mean it brings about in the people and also how loyal they become when you show compassion and empathy uh they are, they are, they become your followers and they do more than what they usually do and that's that extra bit of performance that that uplift yeah, yeah. that you end up getting yeah. brilliant so for return on capital employed to return on compassion and empathy right that's it's, it's a fantastic transformation and right. uh, this may be an intangible one right you are not Absolutely. physically you yeah. know trying to create more assets but right. here you are you know sweating your existing human capital which is your biggest asset right. trying to transform productivity right? yeah. so how does it impact your uh, team dynamics how, do you have any instances or examples mm-hmm. of how this has you know helped you in decision making or it has helped you in uh, managing some uh, major crisis can you show us uh, give us some examples well i mean there are there are quite a few examples and sometimes as a leader i don't remember that but you know people people kind of remember experiences uh there there are people who come from very remote locations yes our own employees let's say they are sitting in a bhubaneswar or uh, kolkata or something like that now mm-hmm. they come to head office now that's a big deal for them yeah. you know so uh they they are com- they are coming here to visit bangalore either for a training program or a learning experience and then they have an extra half a day let me go to my office meet as many people as possible uh so they have never lived the headquarters experience so when they come here sometimes they don't have a appointment but they are walking in the corridors and i see them and immediately i feel that oh this person for this person meeting a ceo in uh, bangalore office is going to be a big experience of a lifetime you know how can i make that 5 minutes special for them so i bring them in have a conversation look i to i and check about you know how their branches how do they find working in a remote location do they receive all the communication uh, are they connected with the organization mission vision purpose and what support we can extend this is a very small coffee conversation coffee conversation but for me it has a big it leaves a big impact on them so as a leader you should always think about what do i do what action of mine uh, ticks in their mind, mind you know yeah. what and and then i get a lot of time people come back and say remember that 5 minute conversation we had in bangalore 2 years ago yes i've doubled my branch you know it was this size now it is so big and thanks for all the resources that you provided so so i think it creates a very different dynamic in them uh, and and that that's one um, you know one thing i would say uh, we should all as leaders do a lot more did you do this as a cfo or you started doing more frequently as a ceo now no i i i have been i mean it's it's about also behaviors which you want to invest on right invest on yes um, i i do it a lot more as a ceo consciously now yeah consciously now but definitely as a cfo i used to do it not for maybe all the function but at least for my team if i have yeah. a remote team I, understand. i i go and really understand you know how do they feel i think that question how do you feel today you know that can that touches the heart and that touches right. their heart yeah and uh, also able to feel make them feel valued you know there are certain roles in finance you now now we are a large business very true if i win a new customer account the sales team gets highlighted if i uh, execute well you know my recruiters my account managers 
their targets are achieved, they get highlighted. Yes. So when you are doing a town hall, there are all people, there are also finance people, right? Some people who are doing book closing, yes. month end closing, they're working, burning the midnight burning oil to yeah. close on time. Mm. Audits, tax departments, you know, they need to follow up for tax refunds or assessments yeah. being completed. Yeah, time bound. Yeah. How do they relate to the organization's mission? How are they contributing to the organization's success? And do they get rewarded or mentioned, called out in these meetings, right? So we often look at, you know, people who have done a phenomenal job, you know, like they got a huge tax refund, you know. I think we call them out call them. Uh, so that people in the business also know what Should the functions know, yeah, are doing. Exactly right. what they have done, how they have been able to contribute to the overall growth of the right. company. So, so I think it's about positioning them and... Uh, and this purse out uh, and out performance, right? Uh, I can tell you another classic example. I was in a uh, account receivables meeting and we were discussing about overdues and why clients are not paying on time, right? So I and the conversation was going uh, all over the place, different <laughs> reasons. <laughs> I was getting emotional and charged yeah. up as well. Right? So I asked the finance team, mm. uh, "Do we play our suppliers on time?" Brilliant right? question, yeah. So, we have the right to expect our clients to pay us on time if you are paying all our suppliers on time. So, we started measuring days payable outstanding instead oh. of days sales outstanding. Yeah, okay, DSO to DPO. Right. Mm -hmm. So, the moment you start paying your suppliers on time, hey, now we have the ground, moral ground to go after our clients, right? So, let's do it. So, I think it drove a very different behavior of uh, from procurement team to actually getting all the invoices booking them in the system and, and I told them why we are insisting this because then your expenses in finance there is a matching principle your right. your revenues and costs should match. match so if your suppliers are not sending all the invoices and if you're not making the right accruals your cost and revenues are imbalanced, imbalanced. so by pushing these invoices up front uh, we got our purchase accounting right so our cost became right our supplier payments uh, uh, started becoming more regular. And and now I think we have the responsibility to go and ask our clients to pay us on time. A very logical way. You know, maybe Absolutely. This is where your financial brain probably has kicked in and even as a CEO, you kind of you know, express this in very clear, measurable ways. Mm -hmm. And you're changing the mindset. Right. Uh, not just looking at only from a DSO perspective, but a, a DPO. And uh, once you start living it, right. uh, suddenly the mindset has changed and you become more convinced and you have a lot of conviction in you to go and ask the customer saying that, hey, this right. is my expense, right. this is my you know, receivable from you and uh, this is not matching and it is sustainability or whatever. And the cash flow is in danger. Yeah. You, you know, and people will appreciate it. Today, I think uh, companies are mature enough to understand, as you rightly said in the earlier part of the conversation, that uh, customers, maybe because of uh, cash flow or some other crisis, mm. not paying up uh, is very, very rare. Very yeah. rare yeah. Right? It is uh, because of some process related issue or exactly. some unforeseen thing that have happened, right. but nobody is driving it or tracking it step right. by step. Right. right? So, uh, putting setting the process right, right is also something very, very critical as a leader. Yeah. Right. Uh, in, in all this journey, uh, empathy that you talked about is very, very interesting. Right? It is uh, maybe invisible as it. Mm but you have weaponized it. Mm. And weaponization of empathy is a skill. Mm. And that gives a huge compounding effect within the organization. Mm. How did you go about measuring this tangibly within your scorecard that you may have for you and your team? Well, I think uh, measuring, uh, of course, I, I always, I, I'm a Six Sigma Properly. Wonderful, yeah. That also uh, I read about in your profile. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think what gets measured gets improved. Improved. So I think you need to really create some scorecards which uh, help you measure empathy. You know, it could be things like anger management. Uh, so so it's it's very easy to get frustrated and throw, throw tantrums. Throw tantrums. Uh, yeah. But but I think it's also about you know checking yourself and ensuring that you know. You are, you are not abusing your authority because obviously finance function is very authoritative. Uh, you are empowered to, to kind of uh, drive uh, organization performance, hold people accountable. So, so I think 
you, you need to control that part. But more importantly, I think it's also about developing soft skills. You have been a successful CEO and uh, you've had varied industry background. Right? So you come from TVS Group and you also have worked in GE. You are a black belt in Six Sigma and you've had uh, experience in Motorola. And again, you've rejoined GE for some time in various other roles. Having this diversified work experience, do you think is very, very critical for a CFO to become a CEO and it will kind of help them very well in their CEO journey? Absolutely. I think I think today the number one thing is about learning agility. Not right? Agility. And when you do roles which are non-conventional, you have a lot that you can learn. You know, it's about, you know, I talked about customers. It's about solving problems. Uh, I think I think most often we fail in defining the problem uh, in the right way. Right way. Right. Uh, that's the first step actually mm -hmm. in solving a problem. You need to define, define it. Define it correctly. And and the moment you have defined it, you also need to see, uh, you know, Six Sigma talks about a DMAC approach: define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Control. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you follow that methodology. Uh, most often we address the surface of the problem. A client reported an issue. Uh, somebody is assigned the task, they address it. Now, Six Sigma talks about repeatability and reproducibility. Now, that problem can repeat again for some other customer, right? Or in some other process. So, am I addressing the root cause of the issue? And that requires a thorough probing. You know, especially in areas like, you know, compliance, it could be provident fund or it could be paying salaries on time or it could be paying suppliers on time. Address the root causes, uh, not just solve that situation, that issue. Uh, then I think uh, it repeats. Second thing is variation, right? Uh, in any process, you need to control the variation. The variation is large. large. It's going to give you a lot of quality issues. Sure. So, so let's say uh, if you are looking at a process of uh, month closing, book closing, uh, what's the time it takes? So when should I start? When should it end? Uh, and then what's the variation? How many months did I close it two days before? How many times did I close it on time? On time. How many times did I close it three days after time? Uh, if that is the case, then your variation is plus or minus five days, five days right? Yeah. So, how can I bring that down to two days? Two days. I Either I close one day before or on date or one day after. Mm -hmm. Then you control the variation. Mm -hmm. So, I think if finance people can apply this, I think it can give a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, they can control the overall process. I, I talked about repeatability and reproducibility. reproducibility. Right. So, most often in finance departments, People are scared, you know. I mean, they are always overworked. Overwork. Headcount in finance is always, <laughs> always uh, yeah. a luxury. To a luxury have. or no, uh, frowned upon. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, I think I think you need to ensure process is repeatable, right? right. Yes. Uh, and what I say as repeatable is, if I am doing a certain process in a certain way, tomorrow if Ramesh is doing that process, is he doing the same way as which he was doing? Right. Understand. Uh, so, how can that happen through automation, through simplification? Uh, reproducibility is if I am doing the process in a certain way, and one week later, if I am asked to do the same process again, will I do it in the same way or in a different way? So, so I think if those two are controlled, I think there will be a lot of uh, freedom, or rather. Flexibility for finance people. Okay, I can take a vacation. Uh, in my there is work-life balance for them eventually. Ramesh eventually, will yeah. be able to do the same do the job same. in the same way. Right? Without much uh, right. uh, bias or variation right. within but, for the But often we are like very people dependent. Or oh, if this person goes on leave, this whole organization Comes is going to be a standstill. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think those are some concerns uh, which which I see often here in finance teams. Uh, so, so I would recommend a Six Sigma orientation. Today, I think the DMAC approach is much more simplified. You have lean Six Sigma. Lean Six Sigma. Uh, right. Things can, you know, you can just use the tools. If not, qualify as a Six Sigma, certify, uh, get a certification. 
at least use the tools. You know, the fishbone is a great way to do root cause. Root cause yeah. A Pareto chart is a great way to understand the 80-20 rule. What are 80% of the problems are causing, uh, you know, what, what are 20% of the problem causing 80% of the defects? Yeah. So, so these familiarizing these tools can make you a lot more, um, you know, creative in terms of, uh, you know, solving problems. We talked about automation. And I, I do remember, you know, you're talking about digital tsunami right. happening uh, in one of your podcasts uh, right. that I, you know, happened to you know, watch. Yeah. I would like to understand your you know, play, the digital transformation play that you are adopting for your organization and how is it impacting you in terms of business risk. So to me, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, digital transformation and digital tsunami is the order of the day. Uh, I was speaking to someone about, uh, there is often this question about what's going to change. Uh, 2040, how will things be? What will finance roles become, uh, you know, extinct? Right, extinct. AI yeah. is coming. Um, you know, will these jobs remain? But that's a common concern yeah, for common all the people, yeah. right? And uh, there is no point in getting worried about the future because we don't know what's going to change, right? Because 2040 is a long time away, 16 years <laughs> from now. Uh, instead, I start thinking about what is not going to change in 2040. Uh, and uh, if I look back 20 years before and now, what I was worried 20 years before and what's happening now, the thing that is not changing is clients' uh, expectations, expectations around okay. speed, quality, and cost. cost. I want the product at the fastest cycle time. In those days, maybe the fastest cycle time was 24 hours. Today, with the Swiggy and Instamart, it's like six minutes. Six minutes. <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, um, so, so that's the speed part. And then the quality. I think, um, I mean, as Indians, we always want the best quality product, right? right. Nobody likes a product which, when you open from the box, is not working. Right. Right. So so that's not going to change. And then the third one is the cost. I, I need all the features, but I need it at a most economical right. price. Right. Maybe a few years ago, we used to buy an Android phone, 20, 25,000 rupees. That was the best phone in the market. Right. Today, people don't mind spending a lakh and 50,000 to buy an iPhone. Right, uh, or even a Samsung Android phone comes at that price, but uh, they are willing to pay for the features and the uh, experience they get from that. And it evolves as the generation, you know, maybe the Gen Zs are a lot more savvy about technology, so they don't mind investing on uh, some of the luxuries in, the, in, in, in which they aspire for. Uh, so if you start thinking about what's not going to change, then you can design your products, design your services, design your systems to meet those three requirements. 80% of the problem you're addressing. Interesting. 20% is a change. Okay, this may this technology may get ex extinct, something else will come, which is fine. So it's still most of the process you control. So if you start thinking about that, not be fearful, be open to change, continue to be curious, continue to be learning, I think. You also talked about Gen Z and um, in in today's world, millennials and Gen Z, they have their own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, they are multi-threading all, all the time. Mm -hmm. And they also have significant instant gratification, like the way that things have changed. Right? And everything is Swiggy and Zomato, you know, they deliver it in maybe Zepto. Mm -hmm. They deliver it in less than 10 minutes. Right? There's a lot of uh, everything, the instant results that are coming in. And they don't want to be committed to something. Uh, even in your finance profession, there are a lot of yeah. Gen Z who are coming in today. Right. Right. So um, uh, they don't believe in job for life or what we call as an iron bowl, mm. iron rice bowl. Mm. Right. So well, that concept has vanished or fading away. Mm. So what would be your advice and uh, specifically for Gen Z finance professional and how do you deal with them and what would be your advice for them to, you know, if they want to be in the journey to a CEO right. and uh, what should they start focusing on? Well, whether you like it or not, 74% of our workforce in future will be Gen Z. Gen Z. Because 
the average age of the economy, the country is about 29 years. So they are going to form the bulk of your workforce, whether it is finance or sales or any function. So we got to learn to manage them. They come with excellent skills. Uh, you know, they're capable of taking challenges. They they don't resist from, uh, you know, doing Learning. the conventional yeah. things. They, they want to, they want to, they look, care, they care for experience, right? And they also care for independence. So you cannot be micromanaging them. So most often we want to give instructions and we want teams to follow it. But Gen Zs like to be a little bit more independent. Uh, independent. They, they like to bring in their best version at work. They like a place where they can feel belong. belong. So, uh, so if you are able to kind of give them that which they aspire for, they can bring phenomenal results. And they don't like, you know, okay, to move the career the way it is. They, 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 they like to say, they like the freedom to say four days I want to work. The fifth day, I want to go trekking, right? Uh, so their passion is. So I think as leaders, you got to embrace their passion. Passion. There is a passion which is professional. There is also a passion which is their personal, which they want to. And as long as managers, we are kind of investing time, investing time, yeah. giving them the right guidance. Of course, you still want them to perform. Nobody right. has a free lunch. Free, yeah. But but at the same time, make those personal collections. Find out what you know what they aspire for and how, and if you are able to show that interest in uh, in some of their things which they aspire for, I think it can have a big impact on uh, their productivity. So, productivity yeah. but they are very talented, and uh, we should not be um, you know too kind of critical about this the way I want it to be done. But rather define the outcome that you want, give them the freedom to do the way they think they would deliver. They would be able to yeah. deliver. And the first time CFOs or the CFOs who are wanting to become a CEO, what would be your two cents that you want to kind of you know, share with them saying that, hey, you do these, these, these. Mm -hmm. Probably it will help you in your journey and accelerate your journey. Right. What would those be? I mean, I would say first one is create your own network, right? Okay. Expand your network, right? Network is network. Yeah, network, network is, is network. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, network is network. And, yeah. and the network has to be not just making connections, but making meaningful connections. So it could be, uh, you know, CFOs across your industry. It could be uh, other functions, uh, you know. Uh, so so basically that that would be a big win, Uh because most often we are very um, what you, introverts, mm -hmm. right? We are, we are not really socially uh, available. Yeah. Uh, be prominent on social media, you know, because there are a lot of... Uh, today, I think if you see what ticks the economy is the influences, whether it is for a food or whether it's for a tourism, I think there are a lot of influencer influences. economy, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can be an influencer. You can create a community of followers who really look forward to... Uh, you know, what works for you, they aspire for role modeling you. So I think you need to become a role model. Role model. Right. Uh, the other things which I think are, uh, you know, strategy. Uh, any business runs on a strategy, right? Uh, it's about, and strategy is something where you will decide what you will do. More importantly, you will also decide what you will not do. Trade off, right? Mm -hmm. Trade off. And things, the question which I ask is, the who, what, how, right? So basically, the what is about, you know, the where, where and the how. Where do we want to play as an organization, right? Yeah. Uh, and then how will we win? Mm. So if we are able to kind of articulate these questions, co-create those strategies with the business teams, then I think finance people will become a lot more strategic in their mindset. Uh, the last thing I would say is also about... Uh, you know, I said reflections, so, um, very important tool. Very important. Uh, and constantly look for a 360-degree feedback because uh, there are a lot of biases. You know, sometimes you don't, you're not self-aware. 
right? You have a lot of blind stops, blind, blind spots, spots which yeah. you don't recognize. Exactly, yeah. So have a mentor, have a coach who can actually give you advice about situations. I have, I have a community of 144 finance people uh, who have worked with me in the past okay. uh, and who like to be part of the community. And I set aside Saturdays, so, uh, you know, four to six. I had a review with my boss. For anyone to call uh, me, they it was say, a tough review. This is what happened. What do you advise? Somebody says, I got a job offer. I'm thinking about a switch. What do you think? Is this a good company I should mm-hmm. join? So a lot of people reach out to ask. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, my contribution to the finance community to, is, is to see how they grow in their careers. Fortunately for me, out of this 144, about 23 of them are CFOs in different companies. Uh, and, and they have grown along with me. You seem to be uh, good with numbers, 144 and 23. <laughs> we still yeah, I mean, I remember of, because yeah, I have a call every Friday, every Saturday. Yeah. I mm. talk to them. Mm. Uh, so for me, I think it's about how can I grow this network, you know. And sometimes it's not just about you. It's also about what you can give back to society. Give back to so, society and industry. These are very, very interesting thoughts and they're very, very special to all of us because I have personally learned a lot from this kind of conversation interaction. One last question on the personal side. Uh, you seem to be extremely fit and um, I'm sure you are working very hard on the business side of things. And um, what do you do in your spare time to keep you fit uh, and drive mm-hmm. in, in terms of personal fitness, but as well as mental fitness in terms of what do you read, etc. Can you share with all right. of you? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I talked about the good to great book, right? Yes. So it talks about personal discipline and professional. Professional. Leader. So every leader, in order to be successful, <clears throat> should have a sense of personal discipline. And what's that personal discipline? It's about uh, how you spend your day, right? For me, a day doesn't start. I, I'm an early morning person, so I get up almost at 5 a.m. Okay. And for me, that 5 to 6.30 is my me time. So I'm in the gym in my rooftop, <clears throat> you know, do a little bit of physical exercise. And then the last 30 minutes is more about a little bit of calming down. Uh, it could be uh, yoga or it could be a little bit of meditation just to ensure that, you know, I'm fit for the day. And then... Uh, the next half an hour is more about looking at my calendar and seeing what schedules, what meetings I have, who am I meeting, and what should I be, uh, you know, what's my role in those meetings, right? Wonderful. And then I decide about what do I want to achieve out of these meetings. End of the day, you cannot be getting into the meeting without a uh, uh, clear objective, right? Um, and then, of course, you have a grind. Sometimes you also have some things which pop up. Yeah, uh, I have a great executive assistant. He ensures that I have enough space for those uh, su- surprise I, things that come. And uh, of course, you got to end with. Uh, we we do have uh, sometimes we do have evening parties or something like that. But I also it's also about where do you want to cut that line, mm-hmm. right? In fact, so sometimes office parties can be scheduled. Starting at 7, going up to 12. Yeah. Now, at Randstad, we clearly say that, you know, the party ends at 9 or 9.30 or something like that. Because we also want people to go back home go back. safe Save. and come back next yeah, day. Next day, yeah, yeah, right. the best version of themselves. <laughs> right. So, out of, it's about, you know, putting in those rules mm. so people are clear about, okay, what it is. Of course, there may be somebody who wants to have a little bit more extent. But that's their personal uh, stuff. So. Stuff. So I think it's about, you know, as a leader, you've got to create those frameworks and rules. So, so uh, and, and if you are disciplined, then I think you'll also see others getting disciplined. Others following you. Yeah. And, and there are cases where, you know, we used to have meetings where people used to show up late, you know. And most often, okay, if it's a 9 a.m. meeting, uh, it would be that, okay, the traffic, or it could be that, okay, I had this call, um, Usually, those are excuses, right? <laughs> uh, and and as a leader, if you are able to show up at 8.59, I think everybody shows up. Everybody, yeah. So, it's actually changed the culture of the culture organization. Of the exactly. So, we believe in a culture of discipline, culture of high performance. And, and the more and more you drive it, I think the organization also starts accepting it. So, really? I think you have to role model it. 
Excellent. No, leading it from the front, right? Right. right from planning your day right. to expecting outcome from uh, you know, every meeting that you, you are right. attending yeah. to essentially ensuring that there is discipline woven around the organization for everything. Right? Right. That's an excellent Sometimes point. people can say, oh, that's very boring stereotype. But, uh, you know, I think if you, if you are managing an organization, 2,000 people and 70,000 people who work for us. Yes. I think uh, you, you have to make those compromises. Uh, and it may not necessarily be applicable for the young people. Maybe they like to have a late out party or, you know, but, but I, think, I think as a leader, you got to show the path, you know, show the way. And it's Today's called. discipline is tomorrow's success. Right. Absolutely. So there is no moving the discipline out of the equation. Right. right? If, you have, if you want to be successful as a company, you're not running a charity, right? Today exactly. and the day, we're all in it for business. Right. And if the outcome has to be successful, there has to be some discipline and there has to be a... Yep. a Rhythm, business rhythm that right. will propel you to success, right? Excellent. And uh, setting it yourself, leading it from the front, right. and with empathy woven around it is a great, uh, you know, yeah. success formula. Yep. Awesome. No, we really, really uh, learned a lot from today's conversation. And once again, thank you very much for joining our show, Beyond the Balance Sheet. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ramesh. It's a pleasure talking to you as well. Same. Yeah. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you.